Okay, so uh, this is our second session, and we're going to be looking now uh, a little bit more focused on brown dwarfs, which are the objects that we mostly study in our group. Uh, they're kind of a subclass of stars uh, in the sense that they are kind of the lowest mass end of most normal stars. Although, as we'll talk about today, uh, to some degree, they're actually not stars because they don't do the thing that stars uh, are most known for doing, and that's fusing elements uh, to power the radiance that comes off their surface. So we'll see how the differences of brown dwarfs and stars play out. Uh, and we'll see why, hopefully we'll see why they're, you know, for us, they're interesting to study because there's, there's a lot of different behaviors they have because of their unusual properties. Um, again, this is going to be recorded and I'll make sure to have the slides for both the first session and section session up at the end of today. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and just dive in. Um, today, for this uh, section uh, workshop, we're going to get a little bit more into the details of how stars work because we kind of need to know that in order to understand how brown dwarfs are different from stars. And then we'll make that distinction. We'll describe how the idea of brown dwarfs comes about by considering what the smallest star you can have. Uh, and then we'll look at um, how uh, what, what brown dwarf spectra look like, because again, our group is focused on the spectral properties and we'll see the spectral brown dwarfs are, are fairly complicated and they allow us to do, do a lot of more interesting things than we can do with normal stars. And we'll see the different spectral types for brown dwarfs as compared to stars. Uh, and then we'll look at some of the other unique properties of brown dwarfs, uh, which will start to kind of piece into the, kind of the, some of the things that we'll be studying over the course of the next eight weeks, some of the interesting uh, pieces of spectral evidence or imaging evidence or maybe variability over time that we use to understand the properties of stars, of these brown dwarfs in their atmospheres. And then at the end, if I have enough time, I'll talk a little bit about the connection between brown dwarfs and exoplanets, which are kind of another category of objects. These are planets that orbit other stars. And we'll actually see that there's a pretty strong connection between the properties of brown dwarfs and the properties of particularly hot Jupiter exoplanets. Um, and then we'll hopefully talk a little bit about, you know, possibility of finding planets themselves around brown dwarfs. And I'll give up an example uh, of the TRAPPIST-1 system that some of you may have heard about. So that's the a topic for uh, the next couple uh, hours, hopefully a little less than two hours. Um, so let's just talk, start by talking about, you know, what powers stars. And um, hopefully uh, many of you already know that the source of energy for stars is nuclear fusion. Uh, this is the conversion of actually mass into energy. And remember, Einstein's equation e equals mc squared. Um, that conversion of mass and energy happens because when you take two nuclei, like say two hydrogen nuclei, which are just protons, and you smash them together and they stick, they, when they stick, they actually release some energy. Um, and those of you who are who maybe taking a chemistry class or maybe you're doing chemical engineering, um, you know, you may know of exothermic reactions where if you mix two chemicals, they release heat because they're actually gaining energy from the chemical bonds that form when those atoms stick together. Um, the same kind of thing happens uh, on, a, on a quantum scale in nuclear physics, but the degree of energy is much, much higher. Um, and so the main reaction that powers the sun, for example, is a chain that starts with hydrogen uh, nuclei, again, protons, and then works its way down to making a helium nucleus. And that chain, uh, or at least part of that chain, is described here. So all the red dots, let me get my cursor there. Uh, all the red dots here are protons, which are, you know, these combinations of little quarks. Uh, these are the nuclei of hydrogen. And um, they combine in, in certain conditions to form combinations of protons and neutrons, which are called deuterium atoms. They merge with protons to make helium-3 nuclei two protons and one neutron. And then those helium-3 nuclei merge to form helium-4, which is our normal form of helium. So all these numbers I'm giving are kind of the, the masses, which are really the sums of the protons and neutrons. Neutrons in this diagram are all on gray. Um, and so this combination of events, what happens is you just start with four hydrogen uh, nuclei. And when you add up all of the mass energy, rest mass energy, if you take the mass of these four protons, you convert them into energy, you get 3752 million electron volts. That may be a unit you are familiar with or not, but that's a typical unit for nuclear uh, rest mass energies. On the right side of the equation is the products of those reactions, including the helium nucleus and a couple other things, a couple of anti-electrons or positrons, 
and a couple of neutrinos, electron neutrinos. These are additional kind of particles that come out of this reaction. Um, their masses don't ma matter too much, but what does matter is that the mass on this side is much less, at least a little bit less. It's 37.28 MeV. And the difference between those two numbers, which is about 24 MeV or so, is just energy that's released as part of the reaction. In effect, what we've done is we've taken some of the mass of our hydrogen, a tiny fraction of it, and converted it directly into energy through this reaction. We didn't do it, fusion just does it on its own. It's part of quantum mechanics. Um, but that little bit of release of energy for every one of those reactions, uh, we've done over and over and over again throughout the and core of the star, is enough to provide all of that luminous energy that comes off the surface. So this is really kind of the source of what powers these stars. Uh, that provides that luminosity. Obviously this happens in the core, but the energy kind of works its way out through the interior and eventually makes it to the surface and radiates away. And the radiated away energy, which we detect with our telescopes, is equal in magnitude to the energy that's being created at the core of the star. So this is the source of star's energy. And because it's the fusion of hydrogen, which remember is the most common element inside the star, into helium, the second most common element, these reactions can last for a long time, depending on the mass of the star. We saw some of the star lifetimes in the first, uh, uh, first part. Remember the sun, for example, is gonna have a total lifetime of about 10 billion years. That's set entirely by the rate at which it's creating energy from fusion and the amount of hydrogen it has in its core. All right, so those, that's where those lifetimes come from. So, uh, so, you know, this is, you know, this is where our source of energy comes from. Now, you know, hydrogen fusion, that's a very common thing in stars, but of course it doesn't happen around here, fortunately, because that would be a kind of a mess. Uh, in fact, we're trying extremely hard to create fusion in uh, experiments such as the, the Tokamak experiment uh, up here in San Diego um, at General Atomics. And there's an experiment uh, in France uh, that's uh, underway to try to produce a sustainable fusion reaction. It's hard to do this because you need extremely high temperatures and densities in order to create these fusion reactions. And the energy they release can then destroy the conditions uh, that produce, provide those high temperatures and densities. So this is the kind of thing that happens in stars, but it's hard to do here on the ground. Um, here's just another layout of one of the, the that what I described for the hydrogen proton chain is just this part of the chain. In fact, there's a couple other branches that occur. Uh, you can get helium three to merge with helium four and make beryllium. There's a whole other sort of set of reactions here. The details of the reactions are actually not that important, although we will talk a little bit about this chain, which is uh, the part of the fusion chain that uh, turns lithium into uh, helium. Um, that's actually gonna be important part of the story a little bit later on. But in any case, all of these reactions all end up with helium being the main product at the end, right? Uh, sometimes two if it's, a, if it's a double reaction, right? But the net reaction is always hydrogen and helium. And again, that is the source of energy for the interior of the sun. Now, again, as I mentioned, this requires extremely high temperatures in the cores of the sun to maintain. And part of that is just because when you take two protons, which are positively charged particles, there's another force at work and that's electrostatic repulsion. So hopefully you remember from your physics class, if you take two positive charges and you try to move them together, they will repel each other through the electrostatic force. And when you take two positive protons, you have to get them as close as essentially a proton away from each other because they get very close to touching. And so the distance between those charges gets extremely small. And so that's a powerful force to keep those protons from coming together. So you need to have really high energies to really drive those protons close enough so that they can get in that regime where they can stick together through another force called the strong force. A lot of forces involved in this process, right? Um, but in any case, you need high, condition, high temperature conditions and high density conditions for that to happen. And that's indeed what we do see in the sun. So it's a little hard to read on this diagram, but the center of the sun, uh, as far as we know, is on the order of about 16 million degrees Kelvin. Now remember, the surface is about 5,800 degrees Kelvin. That's what we see. But the core, as we go deeper into the sun, it gets hotter and hotter to the point where we're at the core. That's a temperature of about 16 million degrees Kelvin. And I should say that that temperature is really set by the conditions necessary to drive fusion reactions. And we'll see how it gets that hot in just a little bit. 
Um, and also the other number that's down here at the bottom is the density. It's about 150 grams per cubic centimeter. Just for comparison, water is about one gram per cubic centimeter. And the densest metals that we know about, densest elements, uh, are on the order of maybe 10 or 15 grams per cubic centimeter. And this is another factor of 10 higher than that. So we really need something that's extremely, extremely dense and extremely hot to allow these reactions to happen. And that's why they happen in the interiors of stars. Now this leads, the other thing I should say that this, the temperature is also, if you remember from your either chemistry or physics classes, that a hot gas also produces pressure, right? There's a thermal pressure for any kind of hot, hot air, hot gas, or hot plasma in this case for the sun. And it's actually that thermal pressure that keeps the star from collapsing. <clears throat> remember that we're talking about something like the sun, the sun has mass and mass wants to contract down under gravity, it tracks itself in. Oops, excuse me, hold on a second. Um, so there's a constant tension between the star wanting to collapse inward and these nuclear explosions literally blowing the star outward. And so the balance of these two things kind of keeps the sun at a constant size, a very constant size. The sun has changed very little over the course of its last four and a half billion years. So um, there's a lot of forces at play here, but the key idea is that we have these nuclear reactions happening inside the core because the core is very hot. And those reactions also maintain the temperature of that hot interior that provide the thermal pressure from keeping the star from collapsing. Everything is in a nice balance, both in terms of the structure of the star and its radiation. It's losing as much energy from radiation as it's creating through fusion. So that's a nice stable system. And fortunately for us, the sun is a nice stable star and it will continue to be so for the next 4 billion years or so. Now, uh, this leads to kind of a chicken and egg problem, uh, as we say in the US, uh, what came first, the chicken or the egg? In this case, what did we, how do we get fusion to happen? Does the fusion happen because it's hot enough in the sun or is it hot enough in the center of the sun because fusion is happening? They're kind of both happening at the same time. So what has to come first? Uh, and the answer is, in fact, it has to get hot enough first for those reactions to kick in. And the heat comes from the initial collapse of the star. Now, I just want to point out that, you know, so we have a star in our own solar system. It's the sun. And it is a hydrogen-rich object, and it's producing its own light. We have other hydrogen-rich objects in our solar system, like Jupiter, which is the largest planet. So both of these objects actually are very similar in the sense that they're mostly made of hydrogen and helium. They both have very large magnetic fields around them uh, that are generated from the interiors of their objects. Uh, and they also have things that orbit around them. So Jupiter obviously orbits around the sun, but Jupiter also has its own system of moons that orbit around it. So taken from these perspectives, Jupiter and the sun are very similar kind of objects made of the same stuff. They both have orbiting objects, but of course the sun is the thing that's producing energy through fusion, and Jupiter is not. We see Jupiter in the night sky because it's reflecting the sunlight. It's actually a very cold object at its surface. While the sun's surface is about 6,000 Kelvin, Jupiter is only about 125 Kelvin. And the masses of these two objects are very, very different. Jupiter is about 0.1% the mass of the sun and about 10 times smaller. So both of these objects start off with hydrogen and helium. But for some reasons we'll talk about in just a moment, the sun was able to start fusing energy, fusing some of that hydrogen into helium to make energy, while Jupiter has just become this very cold gas planet that is our biggest planet in the solar system, but doesn't shine like the sun does. So clearly, there's something that's different about how these two objects evolved that allowed one to fuse and the other to not. The other piece of this I'll remind you is that stars also come in different sizes. Right? So when we looked at the uh, HR diagram, I pointed out this connection between luminosity and temperature, and that they're connected through the Stefan-Boltzmann relation to the radius of the object. And we could use those two numbers, luminosity and temperature, to get the radius. And when we do that, we find that the main sequence stars have different radii, and the, with the smallest stars having the smallest radii and the largest stars having the largest radii. In fact, this is a nice, uh, hope I don't have the plot here. Okay, so that 
So there's this relationship between mass and size. Now, all of these things I'm pointing out turn out to all be related because they ultimately tell us something about how stars form in the first place and how they get to that point where they're fusing uh, hydrogen in their core to support their both size and their luminosity. Now, I want to, to remember when we looked at that picture, that Gaia picture of uh, the galaxy, there were these dark spots across there. These are thick molecular clouds. These are cold clouds of gas and dust. And it turns out that these are the sites of star formation. So what I'm showing here is kind of a, a zoom in on one of those dark clouds. And in fact, this is a famous one. It's called the M16 or Eagle Nebula. Uh, this is in a uh, part of one of those dark clouds that actively forming stars right now. And uh, you can see this kind of beautiful kind of finger of dust. And I should say that this looks like a kind of elegant fine structure, but this thing is about 10 light years across. Now, just to remind you, the nearest star to our sun is about four light years away. So this structure is more than twice as big as that size. This is a huge thing. And so this thing is, uh, you know, of this very large dimension and is going to be where the sites where stars actually form. And they form because these dark clouds eventually get so massive that they begin to fall in on themselves. Gravity starts to pull all the material together. And without anything to kind of stop that from falling inwards, they just get closer and closer and closer together and form an increasingly smaller, and as we'll see, a hotter object. So here's my very uh, sophisticated animation of this process. All right, this is a, uh, if we imagine just like one of these dark clouds, but we've shrunk it down a little bit to maybe just a tenth of a light year across. So this might be the, the sort of pre-stellar uh, core before it's about to start fusion. Um, what happens is, again, gravity is pulling this thing inward. And so it begins to shrink downwards. And what happens is the gravitational potential energy of this sphere, maybe you've heard of that in your physics classes, um, as this thing gets smaller, it's losing gravitational potential energy, just the same way that if I take something like my calculator here, which you can't see because it's being blocked by the screen, um, if that falls to the ground, you're converting gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy, right? Same thing happens here. As these, this star falls inward, it's converting gravitational energy into kinetic energy. And some of that kinetic energy goes into heating the star. About half of it goes into heating the star. And about half of it is being radiated away as light, right? So this collapsing star is converting energy from gravitational potential to heat and light. And that heat is concentrating in the middle of the star. And at some point, when it gets hot enough, and in fact, the temperature it needs to get to is about 3 million degrees Kelvin, the hot core is so hot that it can start these fusion reactions. And when those fusion reactions kick in, not only does it send light and energy out uh, toward the surface of the star, but it also increases the interior pressure to push against gravity and stops the star from collapsing. So a star like the sun started off with like about a solar mass of material by definition. And by the time it got down to about one solar radius in size, it had found the balance between the energy and pressure pushing outward from the core and the gravitational pull from the outside. Basically those two forces canceled and you end up with a nice spherically symmetric object. So we call this we call this kind of what a, a normal star is, a normal mate sequence star. It's something that's in what we call thermal equilibrium in the sense that its temperature is not changing because it's neither gaining nor losing energy. So it stays the same temperature. And it's in hydrostatic equilibrium, which is a very fancy word, which means that basically it's just staying structurally the same. The pressure is staying the same, right? So this is the normal path, kind of very simply shown, but the normal path for how a star forms. And there's a lot more complexities that we're not gonna go into, but I think the basics here are that, again, we start from a big giant cloud, collapse by gravity until nuclear fusion kicks in, and then that stops the collapse and you have a nice balanced star, which will stay that way until it runs out of hydrogen in its core. And then a bunch of other stuff happens after that, which we won't get into detail today. All right, but this is kind of the pathway to a, a normal star. Now, this would be the case for a normal a uh, sun-like star. Now imagine instead of starting with a sun mass worth of material, 
we start with like a tenth of a sun mass worth of material. Well, in that case, if you only have a tenth of the mass, uh, one thing to remember is that gravitational potential energy depends on mass. In fact, it depends on mass squared. And so if you decrease the mass of the object, you're not transferring as much energy into the core of the star. So it's not going to get hot as fast. And the only way to get around that is to just press that star even further closer, make it go smaller. And eventually, it'll get small enough to start fusion reactions again. right? And so if I take a star that starts off at a tenth of a solar mass, we end up having to contract the star down to a quarter of the solar radius in order to get to that magic 3 million Kelvin temperature. right? So again, the whole game is we want to get the star to heat up its interior to the point where it's hot enough to start nuclear reactions, because those nuclear reactions will push back against the collapse of the star and allow it to be in a stable configuration. right? And the more mass you start off with, the less you have to contract it. The less mass you start off with, the more you have to contract it. And that's exactly why we have this sequence of radii and masses for these main sequence stars. Uh, and there's that sequence just in the lower mass range. So the sun mass is over here. So the sun would be somewhere here on this plot over here at the end. And this is a whole bunch of stars for which we've measured both the masses and the radii using the special interferometry technique. And you can see this very nice linear relationship between the mass of the star and its radius, right? And again, that all comes from the fact that it's got to get to a certain core temperature to start nuclear reactions. So this is the origin of that correlation. Now, a natural question we can ask is how far can we push this, right? So if we can take a solar mass of material and shrink it down to a solar radius and get a star that's fusing hydrogen, and we could take a tenth of a solar mass and shrink it down to a tenth of a solar radius and get fusion hydrogen fusion, can we go to a hundredth of a solar mass and shrink it down to a hundredth of a solar radius and get hydrogen fusion? Now remember, Jupiter is made out of the same stuff as the sun, and it is not fusing. So it's very clear that there's a limit to how low we can take this. But the question that, happened, that was sort of raised back in the 1950s and 60s, when really people were starting to understand how stars worked, was what is that lower limit? What is the lowest mass that we can actually have a star be? And this is where we get to the concept of, of, of brown dwarfs. All right, so that's the big question, right? This is the big question a five-year-old would ask that took theorists to figure out over, over a decade, how small can a star actually be? In this case, I mean a star that's actually fusing hydrogen. Well, one thing that's important to keep in mind is something called degeneracy pressure. And this is actually a quantum mechanical effect, but I like to think of these in terms of analogies. Um, if you've ever been to a busy city, um, you know, maybe Mexico City is like this. I know Tokyo is kind of like this. Um, if you're on the subway system, particularly during rush hour, um, at least in Tokyo, they kind of have to push people in to get the cars full because there's so many people waiting for the next car. Um, but of course, there's only so much you can push in because you know there's just there's just bodies in the way, right? You can't you can't push people through themselves, um, and so there's just only so far you can go, and then there's just it's too hard to push anyone further. It's like there's a pressure resisting pushing uh, too many people in there, all right? Uh, so I call this subway degeneracy pressure. It is not the same thing, but it's kind of close. The idea that ultimately you can't put two people in the same space, and so there's just a limited volume to put to put people. Um, it turns out in the interiors of these very dense stars, there's a similar kind of idea, but it's not just because you can't press the atoms cl too close together or the nuclei too close together. Um, it's actually a little bit more complicated because it's quantum mechanics. It's you can't have these uh, particles both in the same place, but also with the same energy. And it turns out that it's the latter that's really important. So another way to think about this, uh, and this is a nice uh, analogy that came uh, from the Harvard Chandra X-ray Center, is to think about it from in terms of degenerate parking. So if you're in a, you know, an empty parking lot, you know, maybe it's like, you know, a weird hour at the mall or something like that. Um, it's really easy to find a space to put your car, and you know, you can you're driving around and you can park it, and now you you kind of reduced your energy because you just you just stop the car, right? Because there's a spot to put the car. On the other hand, if it's a really busy time of day then uh, you know you, you kind of rush around to find a spot. People get really aggressive. They're driving around fast, trying to get into those spots that are very rare. And there's just kind of an energy around that's preventing people from kind of just slowing down and relaxing because they're trying to get this parking space. 
The same thing, as it turns out, or at least kind of analogously happens with electrons. Um, electrons are the particles that orbit uh, the nuclei and atoms. And it turns out it's their energy and their pressure that matters to support the interiors of these small stars. Because those electrons can only occupy certain amounts of both physical space and energy space. And when the energy space gets filled up, like we have in this uh, right diagram here, those electrons can't cool down to get into those low energy states. And so they just stay really active and bouncing around with very high energy thermal rate, a thermal, uh, thermal motion, which of course, if you remember from your definition of pressure, comes from the random thermal motions of particles. So in these very dense stars, and again, they become very dense because you're trying to contract them down to start fusion reactions. At some point, the electrons become so energetic that they just, just can't cool off and they just continue to push against each other and provide a pressure that stops the collapse of the star. This is what creates a brown dwarf, or at least makes the limit for the smallest mass of the star. Uh, and Michelle, you're absolutely right that yes, what we're talking about in terms of the particles not being in the same place at the same time is exactly the Pauli exclusion principle. So this is gonna be quantum mechanics in operation on a large star, which I think is really cool. So this is how it was discovered back in the 1960s. This is a figure from uh, Shiv Kumar, 1963. And this is showing models for the interiors of low mass stars. And what you're looking at is different models uh, of different masses going from about, and this is in solar masses, so it's going from about 0.04 or 4% of the solar mass to about 9% of the solar mass. And they're evolving on this plot to higher temperatures and higher densities as they collapse. Right. And again, they're collapsing, so that makes higher densities, and the gravitational potential energy is causing them to heat up as they do this. And so a normal star would just kind of go up this way, and eventually, at some point, would reach the hydrogen burning threshold, and again, about 3 million degrees Kelvin, and nuclear reactions would kick in, and that would provide the thermal pressure to stop the collapse. However, there's this other line on this plot, and this line is tracking how the pressure from those degenerate electrons, those electrons that just can't cool off, increases as the density goes up. And this is actually independent of temperature. Um, and as that line goes up, uh, as you get to higher and higher density objects, eventually you get to the point where the degeneracy pressure is enough to stop the collapse. So it's not the thermal pressure that stops the collapse, but it's these energetic electrons that can't cool off, these degenerate electrons that push against the rest of the star and prevent the collapse. And if that happens before you get to this threshold for fusion, then there's nothing that's gonna get you there to fusion because you've actually stopped the thing that gives you heat, which is the collapsing of the star. And so this is what defines a brown dwarf. It's an object that's so low mass that it cannot get to the temperatures and densities that allow fusion reactions to happen. And that reason it can't is because of this degeneracy, this electron degeneracy. So brown dwarfs to some degree are kind of quantum mechanical objects. They're held up by quantum mechanical forces, this degeneracy force, and they're prevented from getting hot enough to start fusion reactions. It turns out Jupiter and Saturn and the other giant planets are also in the same situation. They are held up by electron degeneracy forces and they also can't start fusion because of that, that pressure. So there is definitely a minimum mass for stars and that minimum mass is set by this electron degeneracy. And the value of that minimum mass is about 7% of the mass of the sun. All right, so that's a, that's a number that was worked out way back in the 1960s. And as far as we know, it is still true today. In fact, we're getting closer and closer to kind of measuring that limit experimentally. And it seems to hold pretty well uh, from what was predicted back then. Uh, but this sets the minimum size and minimum mass of the sun. And in fact, we can actually estimate what that size would be. And today we actually know it pretty well. And it turns out that that size is about a tenth of the mass, uh, sorry, a tenth of the size of the sun. Um, and it's at that point where you have objects that are too cold to fuse, but are still supported by electron degeneracy pressure. They are in hydrostatic equilibrium, but they are not in thermal equilibrium. Now that last point is probably the most important feature of brown dwarfs to keep in mind. Because they're not fusing hydrogen, these objects are gonna continuously cool over time. Now, before I get to this plot, I do, I've do. i been talking for a little bit long string here. So I do wanna take a break and see if there's any questions. I thank you for Michelle for posting one in there. 
But if there's any other questions before we go, before we go on from here. And I also want to thank Dino for answering the question. And Dino, you weren't here earlier on, so why don't we take a small break? And Dino, you can introduce yourself. I, I, I'm sorry, I missed you at the beginning of the session. Um, hi, I'm Dino. I'm a graduate student working with Adam Bergesser, and I'm a um, fifth year, almost sixth year uh, PhD student at UCSD. Um, so feel free to ask any questions if you have. And Nina will be having uh, office hours Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at six o'clock. Yeah, um, that is correct. And um, I'll and my research is mostly on high resolution uh, near infrared and some maybe optical spectroscopy. So feel free to ask uh, me during these obvious hours as well. Great. Okay. So any questions on the on the story so far? Not yet. Okay. Thanks, Adriana. All right. So just a review, right? We define these brown dwarfs as things that uh, get to the point where they are supported by degeneracy pressure. They don't get hot enough to fuse hydrogen. And that corresponds to any of these hydrogen rich objects that are less massive than about 7% of the mass of the sun. And Jupiter being 0.1% of the mass of the sun definitely falls into that category, but so do a lot more massive things. All right, so one of the important consequences of not having fusion is these objects are not in thermal equilibrium. And they're not because they're still radiating from their surfaces. Remember that you know they heat up as they collapse and that some of that heat is going to be on the surface of the star. And of course, some of the heat is going to percolate up from the interior of the star because it's going to go to you know, where it's colder, which is space. And without another source of energy at the core to kind of make up for the heat that's lost from the radiation outwards, these objects lose energy over time and anything that loses energy over time is gonna get colder. So what I'm showing on this plot here is a plot of effective temperature. And remember, this is another fancy word for the surface temperature of the star. Over time, measured in giga years or billions of years. And this is on a log scale. So just keep that in mind on the, on the, on the x-axis here. And all these lines are models for different kinds of objects. And, and how they evolve. And so if I start from the top, everything that's kind of highlighted in blue here are stellar objects. And you know they're stars because at some point, even though they might cool for a little while, they eventually end up staying at a constant temperature. Now, the only way you can stay at a constant temperature and radiate energy away is to produce energy in the core. So these are definitely stars because they are making up for their radiation losses by fusion in the core. This next group of objects, the brown dwarfs, notice that they continually cool all the way to the end of the, the time sequence here. So these are objects that are clearly not in thermal equilibrium and they're clearly losing energy because they're getting colder over time. So these are the brown dwarfs. And you can see, it's a little hard to see, uh, the boundary between these is again, somewhere around 7% of the mass of the sun. Now there's another category that's listed here and they're called various things by various people. Sometimes they're called planets, sometimes they're called planemos, sometimes they're called very you know, sub-brown dwarfs. Um, it's hard to figure out a name for them. Uh, the reason they're separated is that there's actually a few elements that could be fused in addition to hydrogen, um, including deuterium. And I should say deuterium and tritium fusion is one of the main ways that fusion experiments are happening uh, and experimentally here on Earth, because that's the easiest fusion reaction to make happen. And Easiest means you need a lower temperature to make that fusion reaction happen. And so these brown dwarfs, even though they don't fuse hydrogen, do fuse deuterium when they're young. And you can kind of see that because there's kind of a, a change in their uh, cooling rate here, um, just below about uh, 100 million years. Uh, that's the, the more massive brown dwarfs fusing deuterium for a little bit, which makes them stay hotter for a little while. And then eventually they lose deuterium and they, they, they fuse all that away and then they become uh, cooling brown dwarfs again. Uh, these objects are incapable of fusing anything. And the mass limit for those is somewhere around 1% of the mass of the sun. So some people want to just call them something else. That's still debatable. In any case, all of the objects, either yellow or green here, share the same property in that they 
aren't in thermal equilibrium because they cannot fuse hydrogen for their lifetimes. They are out of balance, and so they just continually cool over that entire period. This is very different from stars that sit on that main sequence point and just stay there for billions of years. These objects never sit still. They're constantly cooling off uh, throughout their lifetimes. And they can cool off to pretty low temperatures. You'll notice that these models get down to hundreds of Kelvin, not thousands. Remember, the sun's about 5,000 Kelvin. Some of the coolest models I have here, and we'll see some even cooler brown dwarfs that are known, get down to 500 Kelvin and even cooler as they lose their energy over time. Right? So these can be very cool objects. Now, uh, you know, if you if I if I was in your position and you know I was describing uh, faint dim things that just cool off over time and don't do very much, you might say, well, that doesn't sound very exciting. Why would I study something like that? Um, and part of it is that because these turn out to be actually pretty common objects that we don't know about, and for a long time it was thought that perhaps there were so many of them that they could actually make up the missing dark matter in the universe. Um, now, I don't have I don't have a cosmology lecture plan for today, but if you've never heard of dark matter, I would definitely uh, suggest you Google it. This is a significant fraction of the mass in our galaxy, right? Something like 80% of the mass of our galaxy is some unknown form that exerts gravitational force, but doesn't interact with light. That's why it's called dark. Um, and for many years, since the discovery of brown dwarfs, people thought that perhaps there were enough of these things out there to be dark matter because they were certainly made of mass, so they would interact gravitationally, but they were so cold that they would be dark, you wouldn't see them, right? Um, and this was sort of encouraged early on. This is, this is very early work, this is back in 1955. Edwin Salpeter is one of our famous astronomers that was the first to study uh, stellar populations, and in particular measure how many stars there were as a function of mass. And was one of the first people to point out that actually most of the stars in the galaxy are these very low mass stars. And at the time that he did his work, they, the only way he constrained it was to say that they, you know, the numbers of stars as you go to lower masses just kept going up and up and up and up. And anytime astronomer sees a line that just keeps going, we're often tempted just to see how far down that line goes. And if you extend this star, this line all the way down to say a percent of the solar mass, you would actually get enough mass to make dark matter, right? That would be it. And again, if they were all very cold and invisible, then you wouldn't see them. So that would satisfy the whole dark part of it. And so there was for, a for some number of years, people thought that perhaps these brown dwarfs were the secret of dark matter, that if you just had enough of them, you could explain all this missing matter in our galaxy. Uh, and in fact, this isn't that recent, <laughs> not too long ago that this was still a theory. This is a paper uh, from his recent 1990, uh, in, in which they say, we find that brown dwarf halos are consistent. Halos are the outer parts of the galaxy, remember? Um, are consistent with the present available observations of dark matter. So even up until 1990, people thought that this was a totally viable solution. Now, there's a missing piece of information that I have here, that I haven't given you here, is that in 1990, we actually didn't know of any brown dwarfs. Um, even though they had been predicted in the 1960s, uh, because the, they cool off over time, uh, these objects are really faint, really dim, emit mostly light infrared, and up until 1990s, we didn't have the technology to actually detect them. Um, and so this is a very speculative, <laughs> speculative paper because they said the fact that we see no brown dwarfs is still consistent with them all being dark matter. Uh, this would change pretty quickly, but just to kind of keep you in mind on the historical aspects of this. Um, so how did we find brown dwarfs in the first place since by 1990, we hadn't seen any. Um, the, we did this by basically using new technologies. Um, and in particular, the technologies that allowed us to study the sky in the infrared, and in particular, to start doing surveys of the sky in the infrared. Uh, one of the first surveys to do this was the Infrared Astronomical Satellite, or IRAS, that was launched in 1983. Um, then when I was a graduate student, I used a survey called TUMAS, which was two telescopes, uh, one in Chile and one in Arizona, which imaged the entire sky in the infrared. This is a picture of the galaxy in the infrared. You can see that familiar disk structure there, the bulge in the middle, the Magellanic clouds there on the side. Um, and then more recently, there's been a survey, another satellite survey called WISE, which has been studying, again, the entire sky in the infrared and taking many, many exposures over years. And so we actually have also motion information, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later on. 
So these missions have been allowed us to get a new perspective on the sky in the infrared right at the wavelengths where these objects are brighter. And there's been several other surveys as well in addition to these. Now to just show why how important it was to have infrared images to find these objects. Uh, I'm showing here a visible light image of one of the brown dwarfs that we study. Um, and just so you know, the image is inverted. So the black spots are the stars and the white background is, is space. It's just easier to see black, black spots on white than, than the other way around. So somewhere on this image <laughs> is, our, is our brown dwarf. So that's the visible light image. Here's the infrared light image. And my question to all y'all is where is the brown dwarf? Or can you see the brown dwarf? I think you need to blink back and forth. Oh, good idea, Roman. Okay, so let's go back to the visible light image and the infrared light image, infrared light image, visible, infrared, visible, infrared. I'm not sure how fast Zoom can pick up the blinking. All right, is anyone seeing the brown? Is anyone there? Okay, Bridget's got it. Let's see if her clue helps others to see it. Okay, well, the help. Oh, Carlos, nice job. Way to use the way to use the way to use the technology, Carlos. Good job. All right, yes, you're absolutely right, Carlos. Uh, if I go back, if I can get my control of my browser back, uh, here's a visible light image. Here's where Carlos circled. And indeed, that is our brown dwarf. And if I go back to the visible light image there, you'll notice that, that you know, it looks like there's kind of a faint thing that's probably a background star, but the actual center of that spot, there's no visible source. This is, a, this is an invisible star because uh, it has no visible light that we can detect with a survey. Uh, now, there, I should say, there is visible light there. It's just so faint that it's very hard to detect with the technology we had at that point. And that's why these objects were essentially invisible uh, from the 1960s to the 1990s. Um, despite predictions and being there, they just, we didn't have the technology to see them. And it was really the infrared uh, surveys like two mass that allowed us to see them for the first time. So we now know of many thousands of these objects and the ways that the first ones were found were uh, kind of the familiar ways that we look for sort of novel new uh, faint sources. Um, one way is to look around other faint stars and find a fainter thing next to it that might be connected with it. Uh, that example was found, uh, this is GD165b, this red up spot here is in an uh, orbit around a white dwarf. And a white dwarf, if you remember, is a very tiny star. So even though it's hot, its luminosity is very low. And so if we're looking for an even cooler object, that might be one place to look for them. So this is an example of one found as a companion to a white dwarf. Um, this object we'll talk about again, this is Gleason 29b. This is one of the most famous brown dwarfs. Um, this very bright spot over here is, uh, is actually a low mass star. And uh, this is an object, this is another brown dwarf that was found again in orbit around it. Um, and you know, because it's so much fainter, you can kind of get an idea that it's gonna be a very cool object. Um, here's another fun system. This is actually a more recent one. Um, this is a wide companion. Now, remember I said that when stars are nearby, if they're moving fast, you can actually measure their motion over time. So this is two exposures taken five years apart. And if you watch it long enough, you can kind of see there's a thing moving over here, which is a known white dwarf. And there's a thing moving over here in exactly the same way, which is its brown dwarf companion. In fact, this second object is one of the coldest brown dwarfs that we know about today. And this is a set of images from the WISE satellite, right? The infrared satellite. So, all of these cases, we're finding these objects as companions to other stars. But of course, we've also found these objects as isolated objects on their own. Um, one of the ways that we've done this, for example, let me actually go back a little bit. Um, to go back to this evolutionary model, uh, this evolutionary plot. Um, here is the sweep of brown dwarfs. And of course, when they get old, they get very, very cold and hard to see. But when they're young, they're actually quite warm. So if you can find brown dwarfs, when they're younger than say 100 million years, they might actually be bright enough to see with regular instrumentation. And that's the case for this object, actually both of these objects, PPL15 and TAD1, 
Um, these are actually both M type star looking things, but we know they're brown dwarfs because this very tiny feature here, which is caused by the presence of lithium in the atmosphere of the star. Now, lithium is a very rare element in stellar atmospheres, in part because it's easily destroyed in fusion reactions. Um, if you remember that proton-proton chain I showed, it was at the end of one of those chains, and it's one of those low energy reactions that basically clears out all the lithium almost immediately. Um, and so if you look at you know, a range of different stars, uh, particularly around uh, uh, low mass to solar mass stars, very few of them have uh, lithium in their atmospheres. But this object should not have lithium because it should be gone from reactions, but it's there, which means that, that lithium is not being destroyed in the star, which means it's not being fused, which means hydrogen fusion is also not happening. Uh, this is something known as the lithium test. And it was one of the earlier ways that we were able to figure out that some objects that you know, appear to be quite warm were actually just very young brown dwarfs because they're just not fusing this one particular element. But one of the cool things, is this is one of the ways that we get to see what's happening in the core of the star is by the fact that this lithium is still around, it hasn't been destroyed. So uh, these are sort of examples of how we found the first objects. And again, today there are thousands and thousands of brown dwarfs known thanks to all these surveys. Um, but this is kind of how the first examples were first found. Now I'm gonna go back to this Gliese 229b object because it actually was, I would say, again, it was one of the more exciting discoveries made at the time because not only was it clearly a very faint object, but its spectrum was really weird. In fact, it looked a lot like a planet. In fact, it looked almost exactly like the moon Titan of Saturn. So let me kind of explain what you're seeing here. Uh, this is a, a spectrum plot. This is in the infrared. So this is wavelength in microns. Um, this is in what we call the H band region of the spectrum. And H corresponds to the filter that that wavelength range course, uh, covers. And what you're seeing is uh, the spectrum of Gliese-Schein-B in this front line, and then Titan here, and they both have very similar shapes. And in particular, they both show a very strong absorption band that we know is due to methane. And for Titan, that's because Titan's atmosphere is made of mostly methane. Um, it's one of the, I think it's only one of the only moons that has a significant atmosphere. And because way out, uh, out uh, at the orbit of Saturn, uh, only methane is able to be gaseous as, as an atmosphere at these uh, low temperatures. Um, so what that meant is that this star, or we now know as a brown dwarf, was cold enough that it formed methane in its own atmosphere. And we know from basic chemistry that that just can't happen in the atmospheres of stars. Stars are just too hot. Even the lowest mass stars are just too hot to form this, this molecule. You need to get under about 1500 degrees Kelvin to make this particular molecule in the atmosphere. So this was literally a smoking gun telling us that we had found something that was definitely very low mass and had to be a brown dwarf. And again, this is back in the 1990s. So I should say as a graduate student, I, this is all happening as I was a graduate student. So it was very exciting. Uh, and one of my things that I did as a grad student in my, in my rollerblades and long hair here was to first find more of these uh, uh, Gliese 229b like objects and then use the infrared spectra that we collected for them to form a classification scheme. Um, so I've talked about the spectral classes a little bit earlier with stars. Uh, this is kind of how that process is happening. You find a new type of star whose spectrum doesn't look like any of the other stars that you know, and then you collect as many of these as you can and you form a sequence out of them. So when we have the numbers and the letters like M2 and M5 and M8, those numbers are corresponding to increasingly strong features or molecular bands or different colors, kind of an evolutionary sequence for this particular spectral type. And that's exactly what I was doing as a graduate student, using very similar spectra that you're going to be using for your research project. So this is kind of a map of what the spectra of these new classes look like. And I should say uh, there's actually three different classes represented here. Uh, M dwarfs, remember, is the, is the lowest temperature class of stars and also the most common class of stars but they also correspond to the youngest of the brown dwarfs. And then two new spectral classes, L dwarfs and T dwarfs, both of which have different spectral features than the M dwarfs. Uh, and then I showed Jupiter because right now we don't actually have a good enough spectrum of a, of a Y dwarf, which is the last class, 
to really you know make a comparison. But Jupiter is probably a good a good uh, stand-in for that. So I'm going to point out a few things. And first of all, this is on a log scale, and this is uh, in uh, out in the infrared rate range. So our eyesight ends at about here. We only see things from there to the left. So again, you can see that most of this light is coming out at the infrared range. range. Um, this M dwarf uh, looks a lot like the smooth black body curve that we saw before, but with some absorption features coming from molecules like titanium oxide, which is labeled here, iron hydride, and especially water. Now you might be surprised to hear that there's water on a star, but water is actually a really common molecule because hydrogen and oxygen, hydrogen is the most common at atom, and oxygen is a really common atom as well. So as long as you get to low enough temperatures, it's very easy to combine these to make essentially steam, right? This is water gas, it's not liquid water. Right? Um, so those features are in there and also some atomic features. This next class, which is in purple, this is the L dwarfs. And what sets these objects apart, first of all, you might notice that these bands that come from this molecule titanium oxide are, have kind of disappeared and they're replaced with this one really big feature, which is just from potassium, the same stuff that's in bananas. Um, and so this is, <laughs> we call them banana stars, I guess, but I know that never caught on. Uh, but this is just, there's so little other material in the atmosphere um, that this one atomic feature becomes really, really strong. And this is gonna be related to the formation of clouds and dust, which we'll get to in just a little bit. Um, but we also see that the water gets strong. We see carbon monoxide become strong, um, but otherwise they look relatively similar to M dwarfs. And then when you get to the T dwarfs, the stars that I studied, uh, they turn completely different. And that's mostly because of these methane features that come in. Uh, methane is an extremely strong absorbing gas. And in fact, it's the reason that we worry about methane as a climate change gas. It absorbs so easily in the infrared that it's one of the main sources of heating, the, you know, capturing the infrared light coming from the earth and preventing it from being radiated out into space. So, you know, this is, this is kind of climate change science and brown dwarf science overlapping here, right? Uh, but it produces really strong features and we start to see other stuff like ammonia appear in the atmospheres of these objects. And the spectra stops looking like that nice smooth black body because it's just been eaten away by so many of these molecular features. So this really is a completely different class of star and the Y dwarfs are even more extreme and they start to look a lot like the spectrum of Jupiter that we see here, which also has strong bands of methane and ammonia in its atmosphere as well. So we're really seeing a transition between kind of the normal stellar spectra that look like black bodies with some absorption in them to the spectra of planets that are dominated by these very strong molecular features in these cold atmospheres. And just to kind of summarize this, you know, some of the main properties that we see for M -dwar of these objects. So M dwarfs, as I said, are, are these hotter stars and they encapsulate the youngest brown dwarfs. They also turn out to be very magnetically active. And that's something that we may or may not touch upon uh, this, this summer. Um, L dwarfs are the next class. And you know, again, they change in their appearance largely because they start to form condensates in their atmosphere. And we'll talk about what those condensates are in just a little bit. The T dwarfs form strong water, methane, and ammonia gases. So they're a lot more like planets. And then the Y dwarfs are even colder and they start to form clouds of even more exotic stuff. Uh, they start to get things like salt and sulfide clouds. And possibly we're getting to the point where we're starting to see actual water clouds in some of these brown dwarfs because we're getting so cold. All right, now it's five o'clock. I wanna take a, uh, first a break for questions uh, since we covered a lot of material and then also a break for just break purposes. <laughs> uh, so I'll take any questions first. Uh, I have one. Yeah. How can we uh, identify G dwarfs class? So how do we identify them? Yep. Yeah, the main thing is these classes are defined by those absorption features. So as soon as you see methane absorption in the atmosphere, like in the spectrum in the near infrared, you know immediately you've got a T dwarf. Now there's a little bit of detail about whether it forms first at one band versus another band. 
But certainly anytime you see methane in an atmosphere, in a spectrum, that means you have a, a T dwarf or possibly later a Y dwarf because Y dwarfs also have methane. And I see Michelle also had a question about brown dwarfs never stop cooling. Um, and that is largely true. Now there's, <laughs> there's always an exception to every rule. Um, there are some brown dwarfs that are right near the mass limit. And what happens is that the interior doesn't cool as fast as the surface. And um, you know, I, I've said that the kind of threshold temperature for fusion is about 3 million Kelvin. It's not an on or off switch. There's kind of a ramp up between kind of very low amounts of fusion then to enough that you would actually, you know, kind of push uh, support the star. So it is possible that some stars, in fact, I can go back to the evolution plot. You can actually see this in the plot there. Um, you know, if you look at this last line here, um, it looks like it's a brown dwarf because it's cooling and cooling and cooling and cooling until it gets to about 5 billion years, and then it hits a balance. So some of these objects that are right on the boundary could kind of turn into stars in the sense that their hydrogen fusion balances their radiative loss when their radiative loss gets really, really low. Um, but that's a real edge case. All of these other objects, they will just cool. There's literally, there's nothing to give them energy because fusion is the source of energy. And if they can't do fusion, they're just never going to. So yes, they're going to continue cool forever. All right, any other questions? Okay, then in that case, let's take a five minute break. We're gonna come back at uh, 5, oh, let's do 5.05, just to keep it rounded off nicely. So seven minute break. Um, and we'll pick up there again. See you in a bit, see you in a bit. Okay, welcome back everyone. Hope you enjoy your musical interlude. Um, all right, we're going to continue on and talking about uh, the specter of, of these brown dwarfs, uh, since we just introduced them in the last slide. Um, and I'm just going to kind of point out to kind of frame this is that um, even though I kind of showed some examples of brown dwarfs, one of the things that you're going to find in your research is that the specter of these objects are much more diverse and have a lot more kind of variation because they depend on many different kinds of uh, properties. In stars, we mostly talked about temperature and composition as kind of the two things that shaped uh, stellar spectra. And to some degree, if we were talking about giants, that would also be another factor. But in brown dwarfs, uh, the temperature and composition is also matched up with things like cloud formation, uh, rotation and variability. There's all sorts of other things that factor into how these stars are shaped. And so what I'm showing here, uh, and this is something, a plot that, you know, by the end of the summer, you might be able to make yourself, um, that's comparing uh, a bunch of different objects that are all classified by the same letter L3, this, you know, again, L dwarfs, and then the kind of the third subtype within there. Uh, that's based on their optical spectra, um, but they're all actually quite different. So they're all compared to uh, a standard, a spectral standard. And that's actually one of the ways that we classify objects is we define specific stars to stand in as the L3 standard or the L4 standard. You're going to see this when you do your analysis. Uh, but in fact, none of these objects are standard. I mean, one is pretty close. This one's pretty close. Um, but if the standard is in red, all these other black spectra are actually totally different from each other and different from the standard because they have other things that's going on in their atmosphere. Part of it is their age. Part of it is their composition. In some cases, it's probably related to the presence or absence of clouds in their atmospheres. So there's a lot more variance and variety in these spectra. Uh, and that's why we have these projects involved in studying these things, because there's just a lot more going on and we're still trying to understand how that factors in. And other things like multiplicity can also play a role that we'll see in just a moment. So if we go back to the evolutionary plot, um, remember I showed these lines that, you know, the lines that end up flat at the end are stars, the lines that are declining over time are brown dwarfs. One of the complications of studying brown dwarfs is that the spectral classes, which are defined by their temperatures, actually don't easily align with mass or age. So when we talk about the spectral classes of normal stars, because they end up in this thermal and hydrostatic equilibrium, they stay in the same spot in the, on, on the HR diagram. They stay exactly where they are in the main sequence. And so if you know the spectral type of a star, you can often get a pretty good estimate of its mass 
Uh, actually, a little hard to do age, but it, there's ways of getting to there. Whereas in this case, a brown dwarf, say a brown dwarf that's maybe on the middle line here, about 5% mass of the sun, will start off early on in its lifetime as an M dwarf, but then cool to become an L dwarf. Oops, there we go, cool to become an L dwarf, and then cool still further to become a T dwarf, and eventually cool still further to become a Y dwarf. This is actually uh, Michelle's observation that they continually cool. They also continually evolve then through the spectral sequence. So unlike normal stars that just get to whatever their spectral type is and stay there, these objects actually continually evolve through the spectral sequence. So again, that's another complexity to understanding how these sources, you know, how do we interpret what we see today to what their physical properties actually are, what their masses and ages and compositions actually are. Um, here's some other properties we know about brown dwarfs. As I mentioned, um, they're about a tenth of the radius of the sun. All right, so that's kind of their dimensions. It's kind of a pie slice through there. Um, their atmospheres, again, are very cool, definitely less than 2,500 Kelvin, um, very low density and very low pressure. Um, scale height is kind of a, a sort of measurement of how, um, how much change there is in sort of the properties of the star uh, as a function of radius outwards. And then in one kilometer for a star that's, you know, 70 million uh, meters in size is, is a very small scale height. Um, and so they change pretty quickly at the surface here. In the interiors, they are a mixture of, again, mostly hydrogen and helium, but in very exotic states. Because they are so high pressure, you have this partially degenerate interior, again, that electron degeneracy that's holding the stars up. But the hydrogen is also compressed so much that it starts to form exotic states of material, including, we think, a metallic form of hydrogen uh, in the sense that it acts like a metal where it's very conductive, but it's still a plasma. So it's very weird state. These are the states of matter that we're still trying to figure out how it would explore in our uh, like ground-based experiments here. Um, and then, you know, most of the way that the energy, the heat gets out from the interior of the star, because again, it's the core that got heated when the star initially collapsed, but not hot enough for fusion. That heat slowly escapes out by a process of convection. And it's the same process that if you put like a, a pan of hot water on the stove, uh, when it gets to the point it's boiling, it's really churning around, that's convection, all right? That's heat being moved physically by taking the hot material and pushing it up to the top. Um, and so that's, for example, why we know the lithium test is a good test for what lithium is doing in the core, because eventually that material makes it to the surface by this convection throughout the star. And then the core properties, again, uh, these are, uh, not hot enough for fugit, so we know the cores are going to be less than 3 million Kelvin, um, but the densities are extremely high. Now remember, for the sun, the density was about 150 grams per cubic centimeter. These objects can get to densities that are 1,000 grams per cubic centimeter or more, extremely, extremely dense. And of course, it's that density that allows them to be supported by electron degeneracy, right? And so as we'll see, these are actually the densest hydrogen-rich objects that we know about in in nature. Um, and in that sense, it becomes sort of really interesting um, uh, test uh, sort of laboratory for studying uh, degeneracy effects in this material. And actually, that's, that was my next slide, right? So um, if you measure, for example, the average density, so this is not the core, but this is the average density of these stars. Uh, the sun is somewhere over here, has an average density uh, of about a tenth of a gram per cubic centimeter. Um, as you go upward, then for stars, uh, so right, right at this boundary between stars and giant planets, right at the brown dwarfs, you hit a maximum in the average density of about 100 grams per cubic centimeter. That's the average. That means the core can be in the upwards of 1,000 uh, or more uh, grams per cubic centimeter. Uh, so these are very, very dense systems, and nothing else gets quite as dense as these objects. Low mass planets kind of do, but not quite near there. So this is an area of very uh, active research because this is, if we're thinking about exotic states of matter, when they're pressed together at extremely high densities and pressures, brown dwarfs actually turn out to be one of the places where that's uh, particularly important. Now, there are other objects that are denser, white dwarfs, and uh, Juan mentioned neutron stars earlier. Those are denser objects, but they're not made of hydrogen. They're made of helium or other uh, heavier elements. Uh, and so these are the densest hydrogen-rich objects that we know about. And hydrogen being a, an important element, that's an interesting place to study these kind of effects. Now, just to kind of put this in comparison to the kind of high-density experiments we do here on Earth, 
uh, one of the high one of the places that we get the highest densities to study physics are um, uh, the uh, ignition facilities to, st to study fusion reactions. Um, and in particular, up in Lawrence Livermore, there's an experiment where they take uh, small capsules of, of different materials, hydrogen, deuterium, tritium, stuff like that, and they shine a whole bunch of really powerful lasers all at once to compress this capsule down to reach extremely high densities and high temperatures in an attempt to start fusion reactions. Um, and by the way, those of you who are uh, fans of the expanse, uh, the Epstein engine is modeled against this, right? The idea that you just send these little lasers and blow up these little pieces and that starts fusion is essentially the laser confinement ex experiments that they're doing uh, up there at Lawrence Livermore. Um, so just to kind of compare, you know, in those experiments, they're getting to densities uh, around 50 grams per cubic centimeter, which is high. It's not quite as high as the cores of, of brown dwarfs, but it's getting up there. They get to densities that are very similar to the cores of brown dwarfs. But of course, these experiments are meant at starting fusion. So the, react, the temperatures are around 6 million uh, degrees Kelvin, whereas brown dwarfs, again, uh, you know, only get to maybe 10 to the 4 Kelvin or something like that, or 10 to you know, less than a million Kelvin. So these experiments don't get to the same high, uh, same low temperatures as brown dwarfs, but they do test things like high pressure and high density. Now, another interesting thing about brown dwarfs is we're finding that they actually tend to turn out to be some of our nearest stellar neighbors. And again, remember, we hadn't found any until the 1990s, but now that our technology is sensitive enough to find some of the coolest brown dwarfs that are known, we're starting to find that some of them are actually quite close to the sun. So this is kind of a schematic map of our nearest neighbors. Um, uh, some of them we've known for a long time because they're visible, like Alpha Centauri uh, A and B. You can see that in the, in the Southern sky. It's part of the Southern Cross. If you go kind of off to the right from the Southern Cross, you can see Alpha Centauri there. Um, two of the stars that are near us, nearest to us uh, is Barnard Star. And I mentioned Barnard Star earlier is one of the fastest moving uh, stars. Part of that's because it's so close. And also Proxima Centauri, which is the nearest star, these stars weren't discovered in the 1916s because they're examples of M dwarfs and they're invisible to the naked eye. So you needed telescopes to find these for the first time. But up until 1917, that was it, right? That was our solar neighborhood. Uh, starting in the mid 2000s or 20 teens, I should say, um, we've started to find other systems that are, that are of the same distance, but are mostly made of brown dwarfs. And so those systems include uh, these discoveries out here and notice the name. So we're going back to our coordinates here. Um, WISE is the name of the survey that the source is found in. What is the um, meaning of these numbers here? 0855 minus 0714. Can anyone recollect from our first session? Wasn't it the source? Sorry, say again? Wasn't it the, the source? Well, this or... is the, this is the source name, but what is what are the what is the meaning of those numbers? So, Bridget, you say eight hours fifty five minutes. What what are you referring to? You've got the units right. Absolutely. Does anybody right remember? Right oh. ascension. Right ascension. Yes. So yes, Carlos, you're right. The position. Absolutely, Bridget. That's the right ascension. So the 0855 is the right ascension without the extra digits. And then the minus 0714 is the declination. So you can see the name contains the coordinate. So, so that's again, another nice way to remember those. Um, so those stars were found again, in 2013, 2014. Um, this system is one of my favorites because uh, it looks really close to the sun right now. And this is not where it is today, but we uh, have measured its radial motion. Remember, that's the motion away or towards us. And we actually have noticed that it's moving away from us at a very high speed. And if you project back that, uh, that path, um, what you find out is that this star came within a fraction of a light year uh, to the sun about 70,000 years ago. In fact, it probably passed through the outer part of our Oort cloud, which is the uh, sort of region around our sun that contains all the long period comets. Um, and so potentially this system could have perturbed some of those, those bodies and sent them you know, into the inner solar system. Um, we don't have to worry quite yet because it's gonna take about 2 million years for those things to get to us. Um, but it points out that you know, some of these systems that we're discovering today could have been even closer to the sun in the distant past and have just passed by us uh, and we just didn't notice. 
And I should say, even at that close distance, our ancient relatives 70,000 years ago still wouldn't have seen this star with their naked eye, right? Even though it was gonna be four times closer than the nearest star today, it would still have been invisible. So who knows right, what we find in the future, what could be either having passed in the past or uh, coming towards us in the future. So that's part of the exciting thing about discovering these new star, new star systems. And again, all of these discoveries have happened just in the last 10 years. Now, one of the literally coolest discoveries is the coolest brown dwarf. And this is an object that's that 0855 that we just mentioned. Um, and it actually has to be one of the nearest ones because it is so cold. And we estimate its temperature to be about uh, 250 degrees Kelvin, which is minus 20 degrees Celsius. So this is below freezing. Um, that, you know, it's, it's just a really hard thing to see. It's really, really faint. And that's, you know, we can only see it because it's so close to the sun. Um, so not only is it very nearby, it's also because it's so cold, it has to be pretty low mass. Um, so one thing I didn't really uh, mention too much is that if we go back to, I'll go ahead and do that. If we go back to that evolutionary plot, um, you know, you'll notice that the lower mass lines tend to be cooler. And of course, again, that goes back to the fact that these things are contracting. And if you have less mass to contract, you have less gravitational energy to heat up the star in the first place. So in general, lower mass things are cooler at a given age than higher mass things, even as everyone's cooling off over time. So this object has to be something on the order of three to 10 times the mass of Jupiter to be as cold as 250 Kelvin today. And you know, when you get down to these very low masses, it starts to be questionable whether you should call this a planet or a brown dwarf. Now, this thing is not orbiting anything. It's just off there by itself but it's got a mass that's actually not too different than some of the exoplanets that we're finding around other stars. So this is an example of kind of starting to blur the boundaries between giant planets in particular and brown dwarfs. This I would say is almost certainly brown dwarf because it's just by itself, but we never know. It could be something that got ejected from another planetary system that just happens to be wandering around today. It's really hard to tell. Now, one thing, the consequences of having very low temperature atmospheres is, uh, you know, if we think back and think about this, right, minus 20 degrees Celsius is below freezing, right? So if there was water in the atmosphere, and there almost certainly is, because water is a common molecule, it's going to most likely be in the form of ice, not gas. And so we start to now think about that these atmospheres are not just balls of gas like the sun, but they're actually also balls of other things, condensates and clouds and other things that could have some role in shaping spectrum. And to kind of show the diversity of this, this is showing um, a phase plot. So this is temperature versus pressure um, for all kinds of different substances. And the way to read this plot is that if I followed, say, this line right here, this alcium, uh, uh, aluminum calcium oxides um, at higher temperatures, so lower on this plot, you would have just aluminum calcium as, as you know, sort of just atoms in the, in the ga and gas. But as you go above this line, you start to form condensations of aluminum and calcium together. These are minerals, right? These are rocks that we see, or, see, around, uh, see around the ground. And so as you go cooler, which is upward on this plot, you start to form more and more solid substances. Initially, they're rocks, right? Rocks like perovskite and ensotite or heavy metals like iron or chromium. Um, as you get to lower temperatures, you start to form salts. Salt is obviously a, a solid, right? It comes out of the salt shaker, um, but there's some point where salt melts. Uh, in this case, we're going from melting to freezing and making salt grains. And then of course, as you get to even cooler, you get to form uh, water ice, ammonia ice, and other stuff, right? So um, these, as we proceed through these lower temperatures, we're starting to look at a much more complex chemistry than the sun. For the sun, we're really just worrying about atoms, right? Everything is completely ionized and, and there's no molecules. And so it's just atomic chemistry. Here, not only do we have to deal with gas molecules, but now we deal with solid and liquid molecules as well. That's weather, right? So these objects are so cool that we actually have to start really treating them like planets because it's likely that weather is a common process in these atmospheres 
And that's going to determine how they shape and what happens with their chemistry. Now, just to kind of put this in context, right? You know, this is what some of these things look like, right? Perovskite, calcium tit 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 titanate is, uh, is a rock, right? Corundum is a, a, a very common rock, encetite, frostrite. Uh, molten iron is certainly something that's a, a kind of scary uh, consideration for weather. You wouldn't want to be out in the molten iron rain at any time. Um, by the way, corundum is actually one form of uh, various gems. So rubies and sapphires and paparachas are all forms of aluminum oxide that have other impurities on them to give them their colors. So not only do you have, you know, boring old rocks and metal, you also have like gem rain. It's pretty cool if you think about it. I'm sure it doesn't actually look like that, but you know, it's fun to think, think that that's, that's happening. So, you know, unlike the weather we have here on earth, which is just based on water, these objects have a whole range of different kinds of condensates and they form different layers of clouds. Um, so this is again, kind of a, a model of what that might look like um, is we go from the high up in the atmosphere to low down in the atmosphere, the temperature increases as we go deeper and you end up getting different kinds of clouds at the layers where these substances start to condense out. So for the L dwarfs, for example, that sort of first new class of brown dwarfs, we think that there are uh, layers of uh, these rocks, these perovskite rocks, and then perhaps other uh, condensates like iron and, and silicate rocks that are kind of coexisting in a different cloud deck layer. When you get down to the T dwarfs, it's likely you have a very complex layered atmosphere of different kinds of things. Deep in, perhaps not visible to our eyes, might be these other kind of rock, uh, rock uh, clouds. And then as you get further up, you get things like sulfides, and, and then further up, you get salts. And then you kind of see these things just kind of get deeper as we get to cooler atmospheres. And we see this, by the way, this is a pattern that we know happens in the giant planets. Um, we, you know, we know, for example, that there's probably a very deep water cloud layer that's under the visible atmosphere of Jupiter, but it's there because we can see the chemistry effects of it. And then similarly, there's other layers of clouds that sit on top of that that we can see. That's what gives Jupiter and Saturn these beautiful uh, bands and, and jets. It's all those cloud materials. So the question is, do brown dwarfs have similar kinds of beautiful banding and jets because they have these very complex uh, cloud structures as well? And that's something we don't know because we can't get up and close to these brown dwarfs like we can for Jupiter and Saturn. So what we would like to see, of course, is to be able to take a picture like this picture of Jupiter, where we can see all the detailed structure that's coming from the clouds. Because you know, one thing to keep in mind is that all that structure is coming from uh, the physics of the fluid dynamics in the atmosphere, right? And that depends on how the heat is getting out. It depends on the composition of the material. It depends on the rotation rate. There's all if you're a fluid mechanic, uh, you know, fluid physicist. You know, places like Jupiter and Saturn are a gold mine because there's so many kind of very complex processes happening. Brown dwarfs would be even more interesting because they're more energetic. But unfortunately, all we see is just a little spot in the sky. We don't get to see these beautiful cloud structures. But what we can do is if we don't have the spatial resolution, we can use the temporal aspect of it, the time, right? So what we can do is we can monitor these star, these brown dwarfs over time. And as these different clouds come in out of view, that's gonna change their brightness. Now we can see that with Jupiter, for example, this is a time-lapse video of Jupiter. And you know, when the, the red spot comes into view, it actually changes how bright Jupiter is because it's not reflecting as much light as say this very bright white cloud that's underneath it. So if we're patient and we make measurements over time, we can actually start to infer some of the structure of the brown dwarfs, even though we can't resolve them like we can with Jupiter. So this is what this looks like. This is uh, showing an example of a light curve. So this is measuring the magnitude, right? So taking images over time. This is actually done with the Hubble Space Telescope and measuring how bright it is and how it varies over time. And you can see this particular brown dwarf starts off pretty, pretty boring, pretty normal, and then starts to kind of oscillate and get even bigger and bigger over time. And we can develop uh, fairly sophisticated models to see if we can reproduce those. And those models are based entirely on the dynamics of our giant planets. Um, so for example, this is, this is one of the models that's able to reproduce this light curve. It's obviously you know, simplified, but it doesn't look too different than this infrared image of Neptune, which has these kind of bright uh, streaks uh, of uh, underneath the clouds where, where, hot, uh, where we can see deeper into the high atmosphere. 
and it glows much more brightly. So, you know, again, even though we can't take this kind of picture um, that we have for Neptune, because these brown dwarfs are so far away, we can actually start to get some idea of the surface structure of these brown dwarfs based on the kind of observations we make, partly with optometry and partly with spectroscopy, but by doing it over time. Um, another interesting thing that happens because of the clouds is um, I mentioned that these clouds are very thick in L dwarfs. It turns out that even though there are probably clouds in T dwarfs, they're not nearly as thick. In fact, they seem to be uh, depleted uh, and seem to be depleted quite rapidly. And this is actually one of the uh, ongoing mysteries for how brown dwarfs kind of evolved through this difference of the L dwarf and T dwarf classes. Um, because the clouds don't just settle nicely, they actually get disrupted by some process that we're still trying to figure out. And one of the uh, at manifestations of that is when we look at some binary systems. Uh, so occasionally when we look at a, a particular brown dwarf and we look at it at very high resolution, we might sometimes see two stars there instead of one. Uh, and that's an example. Uh, here's an example of one of those systems that was found one of my former graduate students. Um, and the interesting thing here is that if we look at different bands, and remember that these are those filter bands, right, J, H, and K in the infrared, you can see that one source is fainter in J and the other brighter, and then that reverses in the K band. Now, just kind of a, a little astronomy lore, when we talk about binary systems, we usually label them A and B and maybe C if there's a third component, and we usually order them based on their brightness. But there's no playbook for when, um, one source is brighter at one wavelength and then fainter in the other wavelength. Um, so this is one of these sort of complexities that we're still trying to figure out. And when we use the spectra to kind of figure out what's going on, um, what we've done here is we, this is the, the black line here is the observed spectrum of this binary combined. And then we've created a model that's actually the, the combination of a, uh, what we think the primary is, which is the L dwarf, this red line here, and the secondary, which is the blue line, which is a T dwarf. And you can see that indeed in some wavelengths, the T dwarf is brighter and in some wavelengths, the L dwarf is brighter. Now this might seem like a little detail, but this is not something we normally see in stars. Usually when stars get colder, they just get fainter at all wavelengths. But in this case, it appears that there's kind of a brightening, a reversal of that process that happens at one micron. And we think that has, has to do with how these condensates are depleted in the atmospheres. Uh, now, just to show you that a little bit more detail. So this is an example, um, another one of these uh, binaries. And by the way, when you start to stare at these spectra, uh, like for me, this is screaming weird. Like I know there's something bizarre and wrong about this. Right now, this just looks like another bunch of squiggly lines. So that's totally okay. But as you start to see more and more of these spectra, you'll start to see some of these peculiarities show up. Now, Juan mentioned early on, how do we know, or sorry, no, I, think it was, I think it was Ibar asked about how do we know it's a T dwarf? And I mentioned the presence of methane. Um, here's methane right here. And this is in that H band region, but there's no methane over here in the K band region, which would start at about 2.2 microns. That's a little weird. Um, and in fact, if you go through and you sort of compare the spectrum of the source to different models, um, or different other, other stars that we have observed with the same uh, spectrum, uh, for the same spectrograph, um, we can very easily reproduce, say, the left side of the spectrum, and we can very easily reproduce the right side of the spectrum, but we can't do both at the same time. So this is one of the clues that tells us there's something wrong about this star. And, you know, I'm giving this as an example is that, you know, as you're going through your spectra, you may find similar kinds of there's something wrong with the star. And those are exciting examples because they are telling us that something else is happening that's something neat about their physical properties that we want to study more detail. And so the solution, as I mentioned, is to actually just combine two spectra. And indeed, we can very, very well match the, what we observe for the system by making the assumption that's actually a combination of two different stars. And indeed, we were able just barely to resolve the system with the Hubble Space Telescope. In fact, just barely, this is right at the limits that Hubble's, Hubble can do. And most people would argue that, you know, this is not very convincing, but we're very convinced this is a binary. Um, and uh, this is an example of how we can use spectra to discover new binary systems, which in turn will allow us to make mass measurements, one of those fundamental properties for brown dwarfs. So this is, this is, uh, this is gonna be one of the science projects if you're interested in signing up for it. 
Um, and one of the ways to do this is, is we analyze these spectra using indices. So we measure ratios of the spectra, and then we can plot the ratios against each other. So earlier on, I showed a color color diagram, right? Which is the ratio of fluxes. This is actually very similar, but it's measuring very specific features. So for example, this ratio here is specifically measuring the strength of this H band compared to the local continuum. And like that color color plot, most of the stars kind of follow a nice sequence, but then there's some outliers out here. And this is actually how we were able to find some of these previously unidentified binaries just based on these color ratios. So again, I'm showing this in a little bit more detail because this is an example of the kind of science one can do with the spectra to find rare or unusual or special objects like binaries that allow us to do more physics with these objects and understand their physical properties in greater detail. Okay. Actually, so any questions about, about that? And I know I'm going through this pretty fast and there, I'm sure there's a lot of details here that I'm missing uh, in terms of describing detail. Some of this will come up as you're sort of practicing with the spectrum. And again, as you look at these more and often, you're gonna very easily see the things that are weird compared to the things that are normal. All right, not seeing any questions. So I will proceed on, excuse me. All right, so let me go back to this source, uh, this Lisa 229B. Remember that we said this was a very special object, one of the first brown dwarfs found, and it stood out because it had this strong methane feature, the same methane feature, I should say, that's right here, same wavelengths. Um, and, you know, the surprising fact that it looked very much like the spectrum of the moon of Saturn, Titan, um, because it also uh, has methane in its atmosphere. So what we're seeing in terms of similarities is similarities in the atmospheric uh, composition, in this case, methane being one of the things in the atmospheres. Now, it turns out that the properties of these brown dwarfs overlap very nicely with other kinds of exoplanetary bodies. Now, Titan is not an exoplanet, it's a, it's a moon of Saturn, but we are finding other giant planets in other parts of other around orbiting other stars. In many cases, these giant planets are very close to their stars, and so they're actually quite warm. Now, you probably don't remember, but Jupiter is, is pretty far. It's about five times as far from the sun as the Earth. And its surface temperature is on the order of 100, 125 Kelvin. So it's pretty cold. In contrast, we're starting to find giant planets are actually quite, quite close to their stars and get so much heat from their star that they're actually quite warm. So this is a, an old plot that I made some time ago. What I'm comparing here is the temperature range for the L dwarfs in this kind of strange scale here um, and for the T dwarfs. And in comparison, what I'm showing is how far away from the sun would you have to be to have that particular temperature for a planet in equilibrium? So getting you know, some amount of radiation from the sun, radiating uh, that radiation, some amount of radiation away, the balance between those things sets the temperature of the planet. That's for example, why Mercury is so much hotter than the earth. And uh, uh, this is in measurements of astronomical units. And just keep in mind, the earth is about one astronomical unit from the sun. Mercury is about 0.4, that's Mercury right here. Um, over the last several decades, we've actually been finding giant planets that are even closer to their stars than Mercury is to our sun. Uh, and these are the hot Jupiters. And you can see here the names of some of these objects and their temperatures. And those temperatures are right in the same range that we measure for the temperatures of L dwarfs and T dwarfs. And of course, now that we have Y dwarfs, we also have some things that are even colder than that. So one of the important things of studying brown dwarfs is that their physical properties in many aspects are very similar to these giant exoplanets that we've just been finding. But brown dwarfs are actually much easier to study because it's really hard to study these exoplanets because they're right up against their bright star and those bright stars completely blind us to the planet themselves. In fact, these planets are mostly detected through indirect methods, either by the uh, radio velocity method where we measure the pull of the planet on the star. So we see the star kind of moving around in a circle. And so we can infer the presence of the planet there. Or in the case of, for example, HD 189733b, 
it actually passes in front of the star. And so we see the light that the uh, planet is blocking from the star and we can get some idea of the properties from that way. But directly detecting these planets is actually extremely hard. Uh, but fortunately, uh, our brown dwarfs are generally not or orbiting other stars. And so we can study them in great detail and then apply what we learn to the atmospheres of these exoplanets. Um, and indeed, um, this is, uh, so one of the uh, other faculty in our cool star lab, uh, Professor Quinn Konopaki is an expert in studying directly image exoplanets. In this case, these are hot exoplanets because they're very young. These are planets that have just recently formed. They haven't had time to cool off yet. And um, she uses an instrument called the Gemini Planet Imager that's able to subtract out the light of the star. So this kind of strange circular pattern here, which looks like a whirlpool, is actually uh, the software taking many, many images and kind of self-subtracting them to get rid of as much as, much as possible the light of the, the star that's, that this planet is hosting, or this planet is orbiting. And you can see this little spot here is the planet itself. And when she measures the spectrum of that planet, um, it's actually a really good match. It's a little hard to tell because it matches so well. It's a really good match to this second object here, which is a T dwarf. So the spectrum of this planet which takes a lot of effort to get is almost identical to the spectrum of a brown dwarf, which probably took about five minutes to get. <laughs> so, you know, we have it easy to some degree. Uh, but again, this are, there's a synergy between these studies because, you know, since there's so much similarity between their spectra, that means a lot of the physical properties that are happening in exoplanet uh, atmospheres are probably very similar to the properties happening in brown dwarf atmospheres. And so we can kind of feed in uh, to the exoplanet groups, what we're learning about these brown dwarfs so that they can anticipate what they'll see when they get better instrumentation. Now, the other thing is we might be interested in finding planets around these brown dwarfs themselves. You know, if these objects form like stars, and we know planets form around stars, in fact, planets are extremely common around stars. We now know this from all these exoplanet searches. Um, we can ask, you know, questions like how low mass of a star can you have to have a planetary system? Um, and so this is some of the work that we're doing in collaboration with colleagues in Europe. Um, this is a, a project, uh, there's actually two projects. One is called TRAPPIST and one's called SPECULUS. Uh, TRAPPIST stands for Transiting Planets and Planetesimals Small Telescope. This seems like a really tortured acronym uh, until you, oh, I don't have a thing there, I'm sorry. Until you realize that TRAPPIST is actually the name of a beer in Belgium, and this is a Belgian-based um, uh, project. So that's why it has a kind of weird acronym. Um, but this is a pair of telescopes. One is in Chile and one is in Morocco uh, to cover the Northern Hemisphere. And the purpose of these telescopes is to stare at these little brown dwarf stars and see if we can see any evidence of planets that are orbiting them. Um, and if TRAPPIST is a familiar name other than beer, uh, it's because one of the, the most famous exoplanet systems that's been found to date was found by this project and it was found around one of these very cool stars. So just to kind of guide you, this is an image of the star field. Um, and just like before, it's very hard to see what star we're talking about. So I will zoom in on our source and it's that tiny little red spot, which you would never have guessed would be important if you had just gotten the spectrum or gotten the image like this. Um, and so this was the star that we studied uh, back in the, uh, I would say about uh, five years ago now. And we did the same kind of analysis of measuring the brightness of the star uh, over time, very accurately. And instead of seeing kind of this wavy action that we see when we see uh, cloud patterns, we saw this very distinct little dip appear in the light curve. In fact, not just once, but multiple times. So. Um, this is combining multiple telescopes, showing again that it's relatively stable, and then suddenly it dips by about 1% and then comes back up again. And that lasts uh, something like half an hour. Um, here's a couple more, but these ones are not, they're on different periods. And so by detecting multiple repeated dips, but happening at different periods, what we're able to figure out is that this very low mass star, right on the border boundary between brown dwarfs and stars, actually has two or more planets orbiting it. Um, and so when we first made the discovery back in 2016, we knew that they had two planets and then maybe there was a third one somewhere out there. Um, 
And that's very exciting. Anytime you find multiple planets around another star, that becomes a very valuable system. And so we were able to get uh, time on a, a pretty big test set of telescopes, the Spitzer Space Telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, and a whole bunch of ground-based telescopes all around the world to see if we can see if there's evidence of, of other planets in the system. And so the animation I'm going to show next, this is a animation from the Spitzer data. So what you see on the bottom here is the light curve taking the Spitzer. On the top is a model of the planetary system. And every time one of these planets passes in front of the star, it creates a little dip in the light curve. And you can see that there are multiple sort of periods of uh, dips that are happening, right? The B is the one that's close to the star, so it happens most often, then C. Uh, the D happens a little bit less often. Sometimes they kind of come in clumps, right? So again, just by carefully monitoring over the course of three weeks, we are able to see something on the order of 100 different transits that all matched about seven different cadences, exactly seven different cadences, which meant that there were seven planets orbiting the star. Uh, and to this day, I don't think there's been another system that's discovered this many terrestrial-sized worlds around another star, um, except for TRAPPIST-1. It's still one of the most exciting planetary systems that we know about. So uh, this is what we thought it was back in 2016. This is what we discovered it was in just a year later. And um, it's important thing to note is that here's our little star. And the distance from here out to the, at least the second furthest out planet is only 5% the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Mercury is 30% of the distance. Actually, sorry, it's 40% of the distance. So this is a super compact system. And three of these planets happen to be in the right distance from the sun that they, if they have water in their surfaces, that water would be liquid, which is the requirements that we think are, uh, that we need to uh, have a very high probability uh, planet for life. So this is a super exciting system. And I just wanna point out that we were able to characterize the star with the spectra that you'll be studying in this archive, right? That's how we know about the star's properties, its composition, its metallicity, its age, all of these things come from analyzing those spectra. And we have several other planet candidates that have been found in the last uh, six months that you know, will be part of our analysis process as well. So you know, part of sort of studying these stars, maybe also trying to uh, characterize some of the exoplanets that are orbiting them as well. Okay. All right, so that's it. Let me stop my screen share there. And just check in and see. So you guys have had like four hours of lecture today. <laughs> so I'm sure you're super energetic, but I'll take any questions you might have. Yeah, wow, exactly. <laughs> oh, Gong, can you say if you're unmuted, do you have a question? I'm fine. Actually, I have a problem. That's why my microphone is open. Okay. Well, if you had trouble seeing anything, then we'll make sure to have the recording up on the website as soon as the as soon as they're processed. Uh, I think it's the connection the connection problem that I'm having. I wouldn't be surprised. But it's fine. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Well, I, I, I think it's a lot of stuff, as, as you said, but I need to, to see again and think carefully. <laughs> it's, Absolutely. I think I understand, but I don't understand everything at the same time. So. And that's totally fine. I, don't, I certainly don't expect everyone to have listened to me talk for four hours and understand all of ground orbit and stellar astrophysics, right? This was meant to you know, just provide a, sort of the first taste of some of these things. And of course, what will help is some of the readings that you've been assigned um, and some of the other sort of video and resources. And I will make sure these are also posted so you have them as resources as well. Yeah, um, definitely the sources that you gave us, it's going to be very helpful. Yeah.
I have a question. So how long will this recording will be updated in the website? Because I also need to review again. So I'll have the slides up pretty quickly. The videos take a little while to process. So um, that might not be up until tomorrow, but I'll have the slides up. I mean, as soon as we close off here, I just have to print out the slides and post them up on the website. So that should be pretty quick. Thank you. Yep. I have been looking for the link of the website. Where can we where can we find it? Because I wasn't been I haven't been able to find it. So uh, oh, Carlos beat me to it. Good job, Carlos. <laughs> so that's the website, and then um, if you look at the top, there's a link for workshop materials, and that's where these will show up. Okay. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I, I sense some fatigue has set in. So let's, why don't we take a call to break for today. Um, I'm going to stay on this Zoom channel for a little bit if folks have questions, but I'm gonna pause the recording. Um,